This episode of the Happy Diabetic Kitchen podcast is sponsored by my diabetes supplier, U.S. Med. U.S. Med offers free shipping and 90-day supplies with every order. Tired of countless trips to the pharmacy? There's a much better solution. U.S. Med. Call them now. I did, and I felt the love. Call 888-885-0012 to see how they can simplify your diabetes care. Today, it's all about grass-fed livestock and how it's healthier for you. This is the Happy Diabetic Kitchen, the podcast about people who love to eat and cook healthy. This is your guide to the world of healthy cooking and conversations about happy diabetic living and lifestyles, where we simply turn ordinary ingredients into something extraordinary. Welcome to the kitchen, and let's get cooking. Hello, everyone. I am Chef Robert Lewis, the Happy Diabetic, and welcome to the Internet's most delicious cooking podcast. I'm here in the kitchen getting ready to explore a healthy diabetic lifestyle. I want to take the mystery out of healthy cooking, explore some amazing foods, and my diabetic journey with all my successes and all my challenges. Let me help you live your best, happy diabetic lifestyle. So welcome to the kitchen, and if you're new to the show, I am so happy you're here today. And with me in the kitchen, as always, is my son Jason, engineer and producer of the podcast. Jason, how you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, really great, thank you. We're always looking for healthy cooking eating tips for our listeners, right, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. So today, we're going to consider the information that's out there about the benefits of eating a meat product that is grass-fed versus grain-fed. WebMD tells us that in addition to being packed with vitamin B, grass-fed beef has been found to be higher in vitamins A, E, and other antioxidants. And you know, antioxidants are nature's rust prohibitors. So compared to grass-fed beef, they are packed with nutrients and vitamins. Also, grass-fed beef has significantly lower levels of saturated fat compared to grain-fed beef. That was also in a September 30, 2020 WebMD article. I don't know too many type 2 diabetics who would argue with that, right? So in addition, meat from grass-fed animals has two to four times more omega-3 fatty acids. I'm not an expert on farming. I only play one on TV, but today's podcast guest is Monty Bottens and his wife, Robin, who live and farm out of a beautiful countryside of Cambridge, Illinois, are committed to 100% pure pasture-raised and grass-fed finished beef, lamb, chicken, and eggs. Now, you can check them out at GratefulGraze.com. The Bottons are committed to this in different ways of farming, both because it produces food that's healthier for us and is better for the animals and better for the soil. This way of farming also comes with so many challenges, and Monty will tell us about his unique journey. As Monty says, regenerative farming is not for the faint of heart, and he'll tell us more about that. So, without further ado, straight from the pasture of Grateful Grays, I want to introduce my good friend, Monty Bottens. Welcome back. Here we are at the beautiful farm of Grateful Graze, grass-fed beef and livestock. And I've got with me my good friend, Monty Bottens. Monty, i got to ask you a question. Are you ready to get happy? How can I get any happier than this? I love it. Well, listen, can you hear all of our friends? We are in the pasture. These cows are about 20 feet away, uh, grazing around, and they are eating machines. So, uh, Monty, why don't you tell everybody at home, all the happy diabetics, just a little bit about you, kind of fill in some blanks. I sure would be happy to do that. So, I'm a fifth-generation family farmer uh, from here in northwest Illinois. 
uh, great grandfather who settled in this area back in 1863. And uh, today we farm uh, about 2,500 acres of corn and soybeans with cover crops, no-till, doing it as friendly as we can for the environment. And then we started integrating livestock back on the land. So we got about 300 acres of pasture land that we raise grass-fed beef. We also have grass-fed lamb, but then we raise uh, pastured poultry and also hogs that we raise in our timber ground. Wow, that is very cool. I just want to read something that came from your website. I want you to tell everybody what your website is. Our website's gratefulgraze.com, and if you spell it wrong, it doesn't matter. It'll take you there. Oh, that's no wonder I got there. there. <laughs> okay, so here's a quote that Monty has on his website. He says, I have a vision for bringing livestock back to the land. Soil quality, animal welfare, human health, rural communities, and the environment will benefit. And um, I've known Monty for over three years now, maybe even more. And I know that his heart is in the land that we're standing on, which we'll talk about in just a few seconds. But Monty, here's the first question today. What's your earliest food memory? Tell us about foods or dishes and the people that might have prepared it that you remember. My earliest food memory would be, you know, as a child with my mother or my grandmother, you know, home cooking. Uh, we cooked everything at home. We never went to restaurants. We, you know, we were six miles from town, so that back then was a was a long way. You only went to town, you know, when you needed to, and you certainly rode the bus because you're not not driving into town. But uh, I just remember, you know, my grandma was Swedish, so she had a lot of Swedish recipes. So there was, of course, a lot of sugar and cookies uh, associated with with grandma. Of course, uh, you know that's how of that course. works. Probably not best for for a diabetic lifestyle, but um, everything in moderation. Oh, uh, well, that's what it is. That's yeah. what it is. So yeah. see, I only stayed at grandma's once a week, so that was the moderation is to just stay away from grandma. Yeah, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Do you do you like to cook? I do like to cook. I. It's always a struggle. I think everybody struggles with finding time to cook. Yeah. But I enjoy cooking, especially all of our, our meats and proteins, seeing how they, uh, making sure we're making a good product and how to prepare yeah. them and giving people hints on how to cook. Right. It amazes me how many people are afraid of cooking a steak, and it's probably the simplest thing there is. I, I would agree. I would agree. So. Yeah. But no, I enjoy it. I just, I would like to have more time to do it. Sure. Well, you and I, we need to break some bread. There you go. That sounds yeah. great to me. So why don't you tell everybody out there, all our happy diabetics that are listening, I mean, tell us the Grateful Grays story. How did how did you, like, wake up one day and say, I need to be surrounded by 100 cows and bulls and stuff? Well, I, I started with this. It's a long journey of soil health. So when I was out of college, my dad gave me the opportunity to make all the decisions for inputs on our farm. So we converted to no-till at that time, which was better for soil erosion and saved a lot of time, a lot of cost. Uh, then later on, we moved to cover crops. So cover crops is something you plant on the soil between a cash crop. So that way there's, uh, we like to say we don't like to farm naked. We always want to keep our soil covered. And then I learned that there's something even more that you can do to improve soil quality, and that's by bringing livestock back onto the land. So my great-great-grandfather, he had, you know, five different types of livestock and probably seven or eight different types of crops that he grew. And now today we've devolved into typically in the Midwest corn and soybeans and all the hogs are in a barn, all the cows are in a feedlot, all the chickens are in a barn down the Mid-South. So it's, it's really become commoditized and centralized and we started just to bring it back onto the land because it's what's best for the soil. Right. Now, after all of that, we're like, well, this is making a better product for people. Uh, people want healthy protein alternatives. So we started processing our own and started direct marketing on our website to folks. And we ship all around the country. And uh, it's, it's just interesting to see how, but I never started out saying, hey, I want to make steaks to sell to people. We started out with how do we make the soil better? Hmm. And this is just kind of what's grown out of that. Yeah, that's amazing. So as we're standing out here in the pasture, there's just a couple things that strike me. And we'll put some pictures on the website at happydiabetic.com under the blog area. But it's all grass. I'm seeing all grass, yet I'm not seeing any fences. So how do the cows not end up at your neighbor's house for <laughs> breakfast? Well, when we started, this was a long-term, what they called CRP, which stands for Conservation Reserve Program. So for 20 years, nothing was planted here. 
And then we brought the cattle in to basically convert it into pasture. Many people spray a herbicide to kill it and reseed. So this was just filled with weeds, no grass. And we used the cattle and the management to convert it back to a grass pasture. Uh, and no spraying, no seeding, no nothing. And the way we did that is we used to set up fences every day to section off maybe three acres or five acres a day in a different spot for the cows to eat. Well, that became pretty labor intense to make that happen. And there's a new technology. There's some collars that these cows are wearing now have GPS location on them and they're connected to the internet via cell phone. So I can take out my iPhone. I can determine I want one acre today draw it on my phone and then send it to their collars and they stay within that one acre because when they get close to the boundary they get a little tone and you may hear it in the background here eventually and it says hey turn around if they don't obey the tone and they're being troublemakers they get a little electric pulse that corrects them it just scares them more than anything don't hurt them at all yeah but then they they come back together as a group and that way we're mimicking how the bison used to stand shoulder to shoulder over a thousand acres, you know, a million of them at a time marching across the prairie. And uh, that's what we're trying to mimic is that ancient oak savanna, a bison elk integration here in order to mimic nature as close as possible. So, yeah, they, they don't have any fences, but these virtual fences that are on there, just like you would for your dog, uh, are what keeping them together as a group so that they impact the land the right amount. Not too much, not too little. So we get grasses and carbon sequestration and more for the future. Wow. It's, it's really amazing uh, to see and watch um, just cattle natural, be doing their natural thing because uh, I think this is a true statement, Monty, that um, cows eat grass. I mean, that's normally what they want to eat. Mm -hmm. And everybody, you know, I got a, one of our guys that works with us, he is a mashed potatoes and a steak kind of guy, okay? And he makes a joke. He says, I don't want to eat salad. He says, I see what it does to cattle. It makes them fat. So I don't know if that's true, chef. Yeah, but, I don't uh, know. <laughs> but I like it, though. In our case, I don't think it is. Yeah. But, uh, no, because I mean, it, it most, is really amazing how they can turn grass into steak. Yeah, and most cattle that we're used to is grain-fed. Mm -hmm. So a little different situation in terms of how the cow grows, correct? Mm -hmm. So the reason we do a lot of grain-fed beef is it's economically, it's, it's cheaper to do it that way because grain is very energy dense. So grass, you can only eat so much grass in a day and you're full. You know, that's why you eat salads is it, it fills you up. You don't have to eat as many calories right. to feed right. bulk fill, right? So grain's more energy dense and it allows cows to gain at a faster rate. And we thought that was great. You know, we, we were doing everything we can to get the most pounds per day as agriculturalists, right? But we've come to learn by feeding grain, we lower the pH of the rumen or of the animal. And that's what causes a lot of differences in the omega-3-6 ratio, the conjugated linolenic acids in a gr grain-fed beef. So that's why grass-fed beef with a higher rumen pH is a healthier option. Right. So it's, it's not really the cow's fault. It's the how's fault. Right, right. I mean, that's modern agriculture, right? The focusing on raising food in a way that's very cost effective, um, but miss out on the health benefits. And it's not really intentional. It's right. just that we didn't know. Right. But today we've learned a lot more, really, in the last five years. When you say it's much higher awareness now? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. You see much more awareness of that. Mm -hmm. So, in, in a nutshell, what really are the benefits of grass fed? Um, and free-range way of growing livestock? First off, they're, they're doing their more natural behaviors, more instinctual behaviors. They're not standing around in, in their manure for their entire life up to their hocks or up to their bellies. And so they've got a much less uh, disease load. They don't, we never have to give them an antibiotic. They're d exhibiting their natural behaviors so you don't get near as much cortisol production. So they're much less stressed. Um, the other thing is the meat itself is a little bit leaner, so it's lower calorie content. It um, also has far more secondary metabolites, so that's a big word, but there's a lot of antioxidants called the tocopherols and um, other types of things that are much, much higher, like 200 times higher in grass-fed beef. And those are all really good things for us. So it's not only an omega-3, 6 ratio or CLA, it also has to do with all these secondary metabolites, and we're just learning about them in the last year, actually.
so Monty, please tell all of our happy diabetics out there listening, what does it mean when I see grass finished and grass fed corn finished? So almost all cows have to be raised on grass because you can't have grain in a diet for a long period of time and have longevity and health. So the cow herd is almost always on grass no matter where they're at. But once they get weaned from their mother, uh, they go into a program where they start to be introduced to grain. And as they get bigger, they're put into typically a feedlot where they get a real high grain diet of corn silage and maybe hay in there, but also with grain, corn grain or wheat, those kind of things fed in there for energy density to gain as much weight as you can, mm -hmm. as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. So pretty much grass fed, uh, grain finished would mean no difference. Okay. okay. Grass fed, grass finished means they've never had grain introduced to them in their entire lives. So they've maintained that gut microbiome and that pH of their body their entire life. Mm -hmm. There's some interesting studies. If you like research, I can get them for you too. But they found that if you take a grass fed, grass finished animal and feed it grain the last 30 days of its life, you cannot tell the difference between it and a grain fed animal for its entire life. So the last 30 days. So a lot of people say, oh yeah, well they're grass fed until the last 30 days or last couple months we give them some grain. You just made them a grain fed animal. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Monty, I've had your chicken and I've had your eggs, which are absolutely amazing. So what does pasture-raised chicken mean at Grateful Graze? So pasture-raised chicken, that can be another one of those uh, tricky terms. And a friend of mine calls it the Fiberati, the marketing people that are out there to try to try to pull the wool over our eyes. But in our operation, what we do, and we really mimic a Joel Salatin, who's a leader in this uh, regenerative agriculture movement, is they're in these barns that have no floors in them. And there's about 600 birds instead of 25,000 birds, okay? 600 birds in here, and we move that barn every day across the pasture so they're always on new grass. So that way they're not playing in yesterday's toilet, okay? So they get fresh grass, fresh mm -hmm. bugs, all those fun things, and you don't have the smell from the manure. They live a much lower stress life. And there are reports of people who have the uh, cortisol reaction from, you know, CAFO-based meats that will cause them to have anxiety when they eat. Now, it's not, it's a minor percentage, but that does happen and does exist. But pasture raise can mean multiple things. When you're working with a farmer, you want to make sure they're moving that animal across the pasture every day to fresh, uh, fresh feed, fresh grass, and not just a little door open on the end of a 25,000 bird barn that, you know, Hopefully they'll go out and walk on 50 acres. Yeah. But there's a reason people are called chicken, because they're <laughs> scared. So if you have a big barn with a door open on the end, chickens are chicken. They won't, they won't venture out. You know? So there's a lot of labeling as far as free range and, and pasture access and all this stuff that's just unfortunately a bunch of hoo-ha. Yeah. So unless you have a barn on pasture that can move every day to fresh grass, that's the most effective way to get those nutrients we're looking for. Do, do you have an aha moment that, that you want to tell us about? Something that maybe through this whole journey that has really struck a chord with you? A couple things. One is it's amazing to me how animals know you and how they react to your emotions. So today when we were making some adjustments here on these virtual fencing collars, um, you come up to them, they know you, they trust you, and no problem. Yeah. You know, and, and even even the chickens, the layers especially, will recognize you over time. So that's kind of interesting, their intuition and intelligence. The uh, other thing that's interesting to me is just what we're standing in right now. Had you seen this when Robin and I purchased this place about five years ago right now? And the first two years we could only graze for two months out of the year because it was still in that CRP contract. And it's really, this is the third season that we've had complete control. And to go from, I mean, it was literally solid weeds to this is absolutely mind blowing to me. I, I can't believe what they've done. And you know, no herbicides, no insecticides, fungicides, fertilizer, seeding, nothing, just cows. And that just blows my mind how when we get in sync with nature, how everything comes together. It just 
mind baffling. Yeah. Wow. That's that's cool. I love that. What, what do you think the biggest challenges people have today um, eating? I mean, what do you think the? I mean, here you are, the producer and grower of amazing uh, grass-fed livestock. What do you think some of the biggest challenges are um, people face regarding eating today, from your standpoint? I'll just share my own personal story, and I think it will apply to some of your listeners, or maybe most of your listeners. So today we had this work here and had the vet come the doctor to come to see the cows and a couple then i had another gentleman visiting the farm we were busy took him to lunch so i go to lunch i have a pork chop it's from a CAFO, provided by the restaurant right with a bun that's a bun that i'm sure has you know every sort of dough conditioner in it Mm -hmm. it's provided by a major cisco type performance food group whoever you know major handler to to a bar and grill like everybody else is. I did have a salad, but the salad probably has potassium sorbate on it to keep it fresh. You know, and I had a I had Italian seasoning, but it's probably got sugar and, and corn syrup solids in it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I made that decision knowing all that stuff is bad for me. Okay. But I had the time problem. Yeah. And I think we have got our lives scheduled so much that it's really tough to go ahead and... Uh, have the time that we need yeah. to be able to do things right and yeah. eat right. Yeah. So that that's one thing. The other thing is is you know better food costs more. Organic food costs more. My grass fed beef costs more. All these kind of things cost more. And in in times of inflation or in times of abundance, we always have to make that decision between paying whatever it is 10 20 30 40 percent more for those really good quality ingredients that we make ourselves with our own time or push the easy button like i did today for lunch yeah and and realize that you know what uh that wasn't a good choice and and i made that choice when i scheduled my day out two days ago Mm. so i'm not blaming anybody else that's my fault sure and i think we have to it's all a matter of priorities right everybody has the time they need to do what they want to do and I just didn't want to do the right thing enough. Yeah. I mean, that's the challenge of life, right? Yep. I know. And, and in this day and age when we are busier and busier and more and more distracted, it's hard to just stop and say that the, the instant, the moment, isn't as important as the lifetime. Yeah. Wow, that's profound. So I'm guilty of it. No, that's, that's, those, that's interesting. Um, but I don't think you have to do, I think asking people to do 180 change is is hard. Yeah. Okay, so if you can just say, you know what, last week I went out to lunch four days a week. Okay, if you could make it a goal of three days a week and set your calendar with which three days you're going to have a prep meal that you made right. at home right. with the correct ingredients right. or, or whatever behavior that is, just to make that three days instead yeah. of four days yeah okay you've improved 25 percent. right i think so much when we want to change a behavior we're trying to do everything at once right take baby steps that that it's such a shock to your right. system right. and lifestyle you right. can't make it happen you can't eat the elephant in one bite so so i and i would just challenge the listeners out there the next time they're at the grocery store uh if you've never had grass-fed beef or pork try it you know, I mean, get yourself a steak, get yourself a pound of ground beef and and try it and integrate it into your diet as part of a healthy lifestyle way of eating. Yeah. And there's many. Uh, it's become a bigger and bigger section of grocery stores today. Right. Um, plus, um, one thing I do ask is that 85 percent of uh, beef, grass fed beef is made offshore. So it's either in Australia, New Zealand or Argentina. And uh, try to look for American raised it can have an American flag on it and be processed here where they send the animal over and right. process it. And it right. says product of USA. So look for that. So you got something and try to get something close to your home. Mm. Right. Cause there's, there's effects of the local climate on your health mm. and, and your local food with, with you, there's a, there's a synergy. Right. And, and try to look for those things. So there's, there's other producers out there like us doing regenerative farming that you can order online, find them at farmer's markets. Uh, there's also national brands, Grassroot Farmers Co-op. Uh, those kind of people have a national presence uh, that you can order online to get yeah. authentic American-raised yeah. grass-fed proteins. Uh, that's great advice. So, Monty, um, 
I've learned a lot hanging around with you over the years. But um, tell tell our listeners about cooking a grass fed steak because it's a little different, right? I mean, you might cook it slightly different, but why don't you give everybody the skitty, the four one one, on really the simple way to cook a grass fed steak and maximizing the flavor. Okay, so instead of the low down, you want the moo down. I want the moo down. The moo down on grass fed meats. So what we're couple things to keep in mind. First off, the flavor is amazing because it's a little bit older cut. It takes about 24 to 30 months to finish a grass-fed animal, or it takes 16 to 18 on corn-fed. So you got a deeper flavor. So don't screw it up with a whole bunch of seasoning. Salt, pepper, keep simple, mm-hmm. right? Next thing is, is that it's a lower fat content, and the fats that it does have are more resistant to um, browning or charring. So it's very important to use an instant read thermometer. Okay, so don't don't eyeball it. Don't go by, well, I've always done it for seven minutes, so that's what I'm going to do. Don't do, well, I'm going to wait until it's brown, because what you're likely going to do is overcook it. So if you have an uh, older piece of meat, not, it's not bad, but it's going to have more texture to it. So if you have a little bit uh, older animal and you cook it a little bit too long, guess what? You're going to have a tough experience. So we want to be careful in how we're doing that, and we really want to cook to a medium rare. So... And I'm sure you've talked to people before. I like to cook on cast. I save the juices that are... Like cast iron. Cast iron. You bet. I save the juices that are coming out of the um, steak so it cooks in its own juices. Yeah. And uh, I'll cook it very hot. uh, And then I flip it about halfway through. Depending on the steak thickness, inch and a quarter, I'll, I'll flip it about three to four minutes. And then I watch for being done. I do instant read thermometer. I pull it at 125 to 130. Then the big secret is put it on a plate, tent it, let it rest. Let it come up to 135, give it a good 10 minutes, and it'll cook all the way through. Uh, so that's, that's the easy way to do it. So just don't go big on the seasonings. Cook on cast, um, hot sear on, on the cast, and cook it to pull it at 125, 130. Don't overcook it. Yeah. If you want well done, uh, flavorless stuff, you know, get, <laughs> get a corn-fed ribeye. Yeah. Uh, you know, it won't taste like nothing, but... You know, you can well do it. That's that's huh. fine. But, you know, to have that good, deep flavor, uh, great dining yeah. experience, grass-fed, medium-rare, salt, pepper. Awesome. I'm, I'm, my mouth's watering right uh, now. Me too. I'm wondering what's for Dang. dinner tonight. We got to, yeah, now, let's, let's fire up the grill. So now, Monty, there's a lot of folks who listen who are close by us and some that are very far away. Mm-hmm. But if you're close by, you have a farm store. Is that mm-hmm. correct? And where is that located? So we have a pickup location here on farm. So okay. anybody can order whatever they want on the website ahead of time. Okay. And we'll have it here ready for them to, to pick it up. We haven't made the plunge into a full walk-in and help yourself store yet. Okay. okay. That's on the future radar, though. But then we do home delivery in the Quad City area, which is Davenport, Rock Island, Moline, Depp, Bettendorf. Uh, We do that once a week. We're looking at going to more frequency of that in the future. Or we do UPS shipping. Currently, we were doing a one-day shipping. So that's essentially a 250-mile radius of our farm. So Chicago to Des Moines, St. Louis to Madison. And uh, we we ship uh, UPS once a week. That works really well. And we did ship nationwide at first. Uh, Logistics have become a nightmare trying to get stuff there's delays and those kind of things so we've just we realize that local food's important so we think that um, uh, you know serving the people within a 250 mile radius is great and we want to have other farms help serve people in other radiuses yeah. so that's uh it's easiest the online experience so nobody's going to judge you shopping in your jammies yeah you know if you walk into the grocery yeah. store in your jammies they might think you're a little odd yeah so you know that's a good part about the online experience and then yeah. we we curate pick your steaks and put them in a box and send them right to you or deliver them to your door yep i've experienced that and the service is amazing and the steaks and the poultry and the pork and the eggs what can i say they're like the best ever we when we started this that's one thing i told robin i said there's a lot of okay grass-fed out there we really want to be excellent yeah and uh, yeah. we've been very blessed with what we've done we've had several steers that have gone prime yeah and uh, we make those into special cuts and um honestly i love the beef and and pork is real specialty for us too um you know pork with actual marbling in it is kind of a crazy thing yeah no it's amazing well Monty, anything else you want to share with our listeners because when we're done we're going to come back to play a fun game just for you well, that sounds great uh, on the fun game. I'm, I don't know if I'm nervous or not about that. You should that. be nervous. Okay, I am nervous. 
I think one of the things that everyone listening to this needs to realize um, and become aware of is a term called regenerative. Many people have talked about we have sustainable farming and, and how great those sustainable farming practices are. The reality is the land that we're farming today is degraded. So why in the world would I want to sustain something that's degraded? So that's what regenerative farming is all about. Regenerative farming is restoring it, bringing it back, regenerating it to a state of where it was when this was a eight foot tall grass prairie mm. with that nutrient density, that life abundance. And uh, so look for regenerative and try to do your best to research to make sure that it's not just somebody else claiming something, but they truly are focusing on soil health right. because that soil health transfers for into the plant, into the animal and into us hmm. and all of the positive benefits of ecosystem services environmental services water quality air quality all come with it hmm. and that's the the beautiful thing is just it's a lot of people talk about how cattle can be a problem the reality is they are the solution to many things that we're doing of regenerating land so it's not i like to say it's not really the cow's fault it's the how's fault so it's not the cow, it's the how. Yeah. And when we do things better in a regenerative way, we can make a better product for people to eat yeah. that's healthier for them, but ultimately we're repairing and healing the soil for future generations. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, Monty. Thanks for being on the podcast. I want you to once again tell everybody where to find you. Well, you can find us. Our website is www.gratefulgraze.com. And I hope that you'll go there. We have lots of blogs, videos. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram, all those things. But most of the great information is on our website. So you can get connected with us there. Um, you can create a free online account. And you get our newsletter on an intermittent basis when we have time between doing chores to do yeah. the newsletter. Yeah. I hear and you. Uh, uh, But then you can order it anytime. Right. And um, we're an a la carte. It's not a get a box every month whether you want to or not. Uh, you can pick and choose what you want, and and we just love to serve people. And, and I encourage people to, when you buy from us, you're really changing how food is raised. Right. And uh, we, we can't do it without you, and we're, we're really excited about the opportunity to serve more and more people all the time. Yeah, well, I know we appreciate a lot what you do out here. It's just simply amazing. Uh, Monty, so before we go, we were out here. I just want to tell everybody, we were out here a couple weeks ago. You do a thing with, called Concert with the Cows. So basically what it was is you had a, a beautiful stage, uh, first-rate entertainment, a full band. You were serving some barbecue, and the cows were roaming around. It was a concert with the cow. We brought our chairs and sat in the pasture, and it was an amazing evening. Uh, Bug-free evening because of the dragonflies. That was really interesting. But a lot of your family, and I think you might even have had one on, had a T-shirt on. Can you tell our listeners what the T-shirt said? Well, last year's T-shirt said, our cows eat kale so you don't have to. Okay, so everybody appreciated that. So we decided to go ahead. One of my other pithy sayings is, uh, our cows live a great life and only have one bad day. Yeah. That's our goal, really. Yeah, you know, sure. Have them doing what they're doing, and, and they only have one bad day. Now, we'll let you figure out what that bad day is. Perfect, but, uh, perfect. They, uh, they, they do, a, do a great job of healing the land and, and raising up little baby calves here yeah. and, and, and doing what cows do. Yeah. Well, thank you, Monty. It's great having you on. And when we come back, it'll be time for the Rapid Fire 4 one one All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for Monty to play my favorite game. It's the Rapid Fire 411. So, Monty, I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions, and you simply have to choose your preference. For example, butter or olive oil, riding a bike, hiking, favorite vegetable, just like that. First thing that comes to No head. reasons. Oh, no, not unless Can you want you? to share okay. reasons. Okay, if it's something really great, I'll, yeah. Okay, so okay, here we gotcha. go. You ready? Yep. Olive oil or coconut oil? Olive oil. Mango or papaya? Ugh, I'm not a fan of either. Okay. Do I have to? No. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite fruit? Um, boy, now that's putting me on the spot. Grapes. Okay, and love it. And the product of grapes. Oh, 
Listen, fermented it, grapes. Yeah, no kidding. Me too. <laughs> uh, pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Um, okay. No one loves you more than me. Grilled fish or grilled steak? I tell you what, that's a hard question. Because I know. When I go to a restaurant, I eat. I order the fish because yeah. I'm always disappointed with their steaks. I oh my. So if well, I'm yeah. at a restaurant, it's a it's a grilled fish. Okay. If, if I'm at home, it's a steak. Okay, I love it. Chunky or smooth peanut butter? Chunky. Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day? Oh mm, boy, that's a tough one. How about my wife's birthday instead? Okay, perfect. All right, happy birthday, Robin. Uh, bacon or ice cream? Oh, bacon. Bacon. How about bacon ice cream? Oh, now you're talking. Okay. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Superhero or super villain? Hmm. Doctor Evil. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Roller coasters or merry-go-rounds? Roller coasters. All right. Now, finally, Monty, if you could break bread with anyone, past, present, who would it be? You get to have dinner with anybody you want, past or present. Who would that be? Mm, boy, that's a that is a tough, tough question. And I would love to have a dinner with all of my past family who has farmed here, and have a dinner out in the pasture just so they could see how things have really come back to doing how they did it. I don't think that's a cheat at all. I think that is um, very admirable. That but would to be have awesome. All those five generations Wouldn't that be sitting cool? together, yeah, talking about what's different and what's the same. And I even come back and cook for that dinner. Really? Yeah, we'll make that happen. Let's just make that happen. Uh-huh. All right, Monty. Well, thank you again for sharing your story. Uh, thanks for making a difference on our podcast. I'm going to look forward to seeing you soon. Sounds great. All right. Receiving your medical supplies like glucose monitors and insulin pumps can sometimes be a hassle, even painful. Painful is taking blood out of your fingertip to test your glucose, but not with U.S. Med. Their motto is better service, better care. It's what they call white glove service, and that's what I experienced. I was worn out by having to make multiple trips to the pharmacy, only to discover the orders were not ready long lines, or we need to call your doc to confirm the refill. And they would say, don't worry, we'll take care of everything. Then only to find out two weeks later that the doc has not responded to the email or the fax. I would reach out again to the pharmacy, and they would say the doc never called us back, and they never followed up. That's the thing I hated the most. Do what I did. Head over to usmed.com. You'll find the link at happydiabetic.com right on the front page. Are you ready for U.S. Med to always provide you 90 days worth of supplies and fast free shipping? That's right, free shipping. They carry everything from insulin pumps, diabetes testing supplies, to the latest CGMs. The Freestyle Libre 2 and the Dexcom G6. Now, you know how much I love the Libre 2 system. I have it on right now. It's a great system, but to have it delivered simple and easy was amazing. If you're just starting with Medicare like me, I know that's hard to believe, U.S. Med should be your next call. You're going to talk to an operator who will know you by name, have your information, courteous, quick, helpful, and knowledgeable. They cover broad private insurance coverages, over 800 private insurers. And they are A-plus rated with the Better Business Bureau. If you're looking for supplies, everything from insulin pumps, diabetes testing supplies, to the latest CGMs, well, and if you're looking for better service delivered right to your door, U.S. Med might be just what you're looking for. USmed.com or call 888-885-0012. Don't wait any longer. I'm glad I called, and I can tell you this, I am feeling so much love. Okay, hold on. I think I hear my doorbell. That must be my 90-day supply. So be sure to follow me on all my social links. You'll simply find them all at happydiabetic.com.
www.thepeopleshop.com. Just look for all my links at the top right-hand side of the page. And hey, if you have a question for me, go to my website, hit the contact tab, you ask questions, I'll answer them, and who knows, they might even become part of the next show. Maybe I'll select your question and send you some cookbooks as a big thank you. Thank you for listening, and if you are loving what you hear in the kitchen, please leave a comment or feedback at Stitcher, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. Your thoughts and comments are very much appreciated. Thank you again. Once again and always, our podcast is produced and engineered by Jason Lewis. Our theme music by the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Band and yours truly, Chef Robert, on the guitar. And of course, couldn't do this without our kitchen mascots, Scout and Tucker. Harriet Van Horn once said, Cooking is like love. It should be entered into with abandon or not at all. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. And remember, no one loves you more than me.